uh, as I said, um, when we were talking to Sudhir about, you know, what possibly the session could be about, uh, some time back, Sudhir approached the Helka, in fact, to do a series of stories on the power of love. And we at the Helka, cynical journalists, trench journalists, we rarely believe in love. And it came as a sort of surprise to see that a man as serious as him could actually discuss that and want to discuss that, and that set us thinking. And we felt it was the perfect high note on which to end these three days. You might wonder at the sort of eclectic platform that we've put together. Nayantara, who is a political writer and has a vast oeuvre, also has a wonderful love story. And that is really why uh, we asked her to be part of this session rather than her political writing. <laughs> Tarun, of course, has written a book that absolutely pushes the boundary of love writing. It was called The Alchemy of Desire. In its own way, it broke every um, uh, barrier of, of the kind of writing that had been done in India. It spoke of every facet of love, uh, explored its demonic obsessions, its uh, reductive power, and also its transformative power. And Chitrangada, for many reasons, but most of all, the line I already gave away, which is that next level beauty is also a trigger for love. <laughs> also because she's done films which, even while they were political films, were underwritten by the strand of love. So today what we're really trying to present to you are many facets of that most powerful emotion called love. I'm going to start with you, Sudhir. A man who's dealt with the human brain, with human behavior, with deviant behavior, with injured souls. At this stage in your life, why is it that you still posit your faith in love? Well, first of all, Shoma, I must congratulate you and Tarun that you have this as the last session. There must be an unconscious wisdom because first of all, everyone here is an expert on love. So, so you don't need any experts. And second, we are also talking in a language which is not of love. Prose is not love's language. Love's language is music and perhaps poetry. So, we are, so first, the impossibility of it, let me we put it that way. So we have the back. <laughs> and the second that it is at the closing, because of course you know that on one's deathbed, no one has ever said, I wish I'd built another factory. I wish I'd written another book. Or I wish I'd earned more money. I mean, nobody's wish has ever been to be the richest man in the graveyard. So when, at the end, when your attachments start going, when the strongest link to life and the, really the last to go are your love relationships. So I think it is very apt that you put it at the end. <laughs> but, but now why the belief in love? Uh, I think that belief was always there uh, when one is uh, kind of um, middle-aged, cynical, not journalist, but otherwise <laughs> it goes down. But when you get older, you start seeing you know, having it in a much, much greater way. Because when you look back, what, what, uh, look, at, uh, look at love's gift. I think it comes closest to a mystic's vision. Uh, the shadows which it gives, illuminates shadows which you had never seen before. Your art and nature, it suddenly animates art and nature. Your responsiveness, sensate, metaphysical goes up. And when you remember when you were love, that's why when they say madness and delirium of love, we were, we were having those Sufi songs of Divangi because that is what love is. Nobody ever wants to lose that delirium. To go back from that delirium and madness to go into a normal world which we have been inhabiting for the three days uh, is actually something very, very arid and alien. So love to me is a very, very absolutely greatest thing for that, of the kind of uh, mystical vision it gives. Second, I think, uh, uh, to me, uh, it is, affords, it's the biggest democracy in the world. It gives every individual the chance to foster and cultivate what I regard as the highest human achievement, higher than anything, which is empathy. Uh, empathy not in an intellectual sense of, uh, of 
to be put yourself into the shoes of another one, but to feel how another feels, even transiently. And that you can only do sometimes in a good love relationship. So to get empathetic, to be, have the highest achievement, only love can give, no other human activity does. So these are very, very strong reasons to believe in love and its transformations. Nantar, I wanted to ask you that from the moment we are born, society teaches us to love within the constrictions of what is considered the norm, ordained, allowed. But actually, love is the most inclusive and the most uh, you know, boundary-pushing emotion that uh, human beings have. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about you know, how you understand love and the, the sort of um, freedom to love that there should be in society? Uh, love is a very great and grand concept in the abstract. But if you bring it down to the level of actual living, I think it has disastrous consequences. <laughs> Let, let's take love in public life, uh, in politics. And the best case we know is Mahatma Gandhi. He believed that the way to, uh, the best way to deal with the, your enemy is to make him your friend. And this is what he did with uh, General Smuts in South Africa and later with the British in India. But when his followers got down to practicing his philosophy of love and nonviolence on the ground, it was a very different situation. And the most famous example of that is what happened on the beach at Dandi, where hundreds of his followers had gathered to break the salt law, and then they were going to raid the salt depot. They were met with brute force. They were struck down by lethal weapons that left hundreds of bloodied bodies on the sand, many of them with broken shoulders and fractured skulls. So that was the result of loving your neighbor, according to Gandhi, when his philosophy was put into action. And the same thing has happened with black and white love in the American South uh, and in the days of apartheid in South Africa. Then when you bring love into private life, I think um, it is the most extreme form. In fact, it's, it's the ultimate expression of individualism. It has no concern with family, community, caste, race, any of those things. It's only concerned with I. And as such, of course, it is very dangerous to society and the state. Uh, falling in love, therefore, is a very risky business if you don't do it within the prescribed limits. And because it is considered so dangerous by society and the state, the most uh, barbaric laws, are, uh, uh, the most barbaric punishments are reserved for it. I mean, there are countries in the world today where women are still stoned to death for adultery. There are communities where the community sanctions the murder of lovers, and they call it honor killings, because those people stepped outside the rules of caste and community. And in what we call modern life, uh, you can also be killed for falling in love if you do so outside marriage. And that is called a crime passionnel in France, a crime of passion which the law condones in many countries. It's supposed to be perfectly all right to kill your partner if your partner strayed from fidelity. So um, these are the strange conditions uh, in which people who love, lovers, uh, have to live. And they take a very dangerous step if they step outside the strict rules and laws that society lays down. 
Chitrankita, I, I wanted to ask you, you know, uh, Nantara mentioned it, Sudhir did, the heightened state that love can, uh, you know, evoke in human beings. I found it fascinating that in both your films, Hazaru Khwaishi and Ye Sali Zindagi, there, is, uh, there are two faces of love. You know, in Hazaru Khwaishi, it's the love relationship that also, uh, in a sense, uh, allows them to become revolutionaries, you know. And then at the end, the love that triumphs is a much more banal and mundane love. You know, it was the, the man in both the movies that the woman dissed, whose love ends up being more constant. So I wanted to understand from you, personally, how do you see love? Do you see it as the biggest force in your life and in your creativity, you know, in, in the way you choose scripts, uh, unconsciously or consciously? Uh, do, you, do you look for love? Just tap, tap it, see if it works. Working? Yeah. Uh, well, um, it's just so much profound thought over this. I mean, I'm just trying to collect mine. Uh, I, I think love is extremely uh, powerful, yes. Extremely, it's one of the most powerful emotions, like you said. Um, and, I, and you're right, I think that's one of the most common emotion that films get made about. Because it's something, like she said, it is something that everybody relates to, everybody has been in it, so much of I in it, that all of us relate to it so strongly and it's so easy to, uh, to empathize, like, like he said. Um, so uh, every time I, I get a film which has a bit of a twist on it and it's not all good and happy and everything's perfect, I think it's so much more interesting because that is um, where you have uh, yourself reacting in ways which you never expect yourself to. Like, like, for example, in Hazaro, this girl gives up everything for a man who leaves her. But that is love as well, when you share someone's beliefs, you know, and that becomes love for her, that I, I believe in what you believe in, even though you leave me, and then she changes her course of life. And I think that is love. And, and, and in Ye Sali Zindagi, I think uh, what happened to my character was that she wasn't in love with this man, but she sees that he's, he's almost ready to throw away his life. and and. And she probably, you know, um, understands love of that kind and, and gets to value it instead of a man that she was running after who was obviously just fooling around. So, so I think, I think it's, it's all kinds, you know, and I think um, as you grow up, you just sort of understand um, all faces of love and, and, and it just keeps changing all the time. And you really don't know how you would react to it, honestly. I mean, I wouldn't know how I'd react to someone tomorrow. You know, I mean, and how mad you'd get in this heightened sense of, you know, this, this emotion is just so difficult to understand. It just comes in all different faces. Yeah. Tarun, you're the alchemist. You know? Uh, I know that you look at love as the most disruptive force possible. <laughs> Can you describe for us, uh, you know, the way you understand love and uh, why you would believe that it, uh, you know, how it should operate in society? So I think one of the key words that's been mentioned here already is what Suri said in the beginning. It's probably at the heart of it, it's empathy. You know, it's a kind of connect, it's a connection. At the end of the day, as, as human animals, I think the one thing that we seek more than anything else in the world is that moment of connection. When you connect with somebody and the world is complete, the cosmos is complete, the planets are in place, everything is in place. And it's not to say that every connection goes into infinity. The connection could be good for a day, a week, a month, a year, 50 years. So, I mean, the legitimacy of that connection can't be determined by its duration. But that moment of connection is, I think, what constitutes for me this idea of love. That for that moment, nothing else in the world matters more than that. And that kind of headiness, that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, upliftment is, is, is something that I would imagine most human beings should live for. I can tell you that that is pretty much at the heart of what I would say is, is the most significant thing in, in say, my own life. I mean, that, that moment of knowing that is, you're connected with somebody. I've said this in the past as a literary conceit that <coughs> at the end of the day, the truth of most human beings is that there are between five to 15 people who really matter in the world. If all of the world were to die in, 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 in let's say, a bubonic plague or, 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 a kind of, or, or a kind of comet crash, but those 15 people survived, you'd be all right. You'd be able to carry on. But if all of the world were to survive and those 15 people, five or 15 who mattered, were to die in a crash, 
none of them, nothing of the world would be worth anything. So at the end of the day, it really boils down to just a small handful of people with whom, whom you have this connect, whom, who, which is what, in a sense, is, is what I understand as love. And the understanding that is anyway difficult because you know it when it happens. Somebody's voice speaks to you, or somebody's breath speaks to you, or some, someone's skin speaks to your skin. I mean, something happens which you cannot determine. And, and, and when that something happens, you know you hit a kind of a zone, you hit a kind of connect, and really there is nothing greater to live for, yeah. you know. Certainly not all the money and the buildings, as Sudhir said. Provided you are not killed for it. <laughs> it's true, I mean, you, you, you could get killed for it, but that, that in itself yes. is testament to its power, that for that moment of connection, you're actually willing to die. That's what the dervishes write about. I mean, that's what all the kind of passionate poetry about yeah. the world is. For that one moment, that one connection, is worth more to you than your own life, you know, and that's extraordinary. And you're being very unfair by being so dire, considering you led <laughs> such a good life, full of love. <laughs> uh, probably in the context of everything we've been talking about, uh, it's fascinating that, you know, all the insurmountable troubles that we've been speaking of, if people across borders fell in love, if people uh, empathized, you know, we, we spoke that, I mean, we called the session uh, the banality of it is that finally, none of the solutions we've discussed are going to work. It's love that's going to work. So, uh, so there, all of us here, I mean, barring me, the four of you are all creative people. Um, I'm fascinated, Chitrangada and Sudhir, if you can just talk about it, that particularly in the creative field, love is a very untethered force, you know? Uh, you come from a conservative land, if not, I, if not a conservative family, which is Rajasthan, you know, the most prescribed society that one can come from. Has your understanding of love changed from when you were growing up as a girl and from when you've entered the industry? Um, I mean, whatever that I have experienced so far, everything is very protected when you're growing up in a small town, you know. It's, um, it's very idealistic, everything's perfect. Um, Unfortunately, as you grow up and you go out, a lot of those things kind of fall off and you have different definitions, you have new definitions. I personally feel it's, we're just losing so much innocence that we're losing love. Um, there, there's this lack of innocence, we just, there's too much information, there's too much solution for everything and we just, we're losing that wonder that you need for love. So, um, where I am today, Love is, is probably the most popular emotion, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's kind of too, I wouldn't use the word cheap, but it just comes really cheap. It, it gets used very easily in an ad or a film, or it, it, it's, it's on your DP status, it's everywhere, you know, it's just something that we just use so loosely, so I don't know how much it really means, but yes, when I was growing up, love meant to die for, you know, the connection which was worth dying for, because otherwise, um, the, the, good, you the, look, the, the good news I'm told is that no matter how much you use it, it doesn't run out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for that, I swear. But I just hope you don't have to die for it over and over again. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. I mean, so I just, yeah, that's the difference. But I think that's, that's for everyone. You know, growing up, it kind of, the definition changes. So did you wanted to... Uh, uh, no, I thought, I thought, oh, sorry, I thought you asked me something, that's why I was... <laughs> okay. Okay. No, but, no, but, but I can't but ask I was you just something. reacting to hers, that growing up was something to die for. Now I'm grown up, I now believe it is something to die for, really. So. <laughs> <laughs> There's a very pretty woman in the audience for who this transformation is probably uh, responsible, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I wanted to ask you, you were telling me that this foundation, somebody put a billion dollars into creating a foundation based on love, and that these are... Uh, you know, that they believe that this can be a social force of transformation. Could you talk a little bit about that, Sudhir? Uh, well, this is a foundation, not billion dollars, it's about three quarters of a billion, which is almost a billion. I've okay. Been all my numbers <laughs> wrong today. Okay. Uh, uh, th this is an American um, man called Fitzer. He owned a baseball team, the Detroit Tigers, and made a lot of money. But uh, so his, his belief was uh, that uh, the transformative power of love. Nobody, not nobody, people have, that there's a huge amount of number of people. And actually we see, I mean, you run a page called Inspirations, and you see individuals who just out of love are really doing this kind of stuff, and, and he thinks that all over the world, there's a huge number of people who are doing it, and, but those instances have not been brought up into the global consciousness of how much love is changing, because people are really focusing on the big ticket events and not on those small ones. 
So how to do that is one of the functions of it. Uh, then, of course, there are all, all the big biggies in the love business, Gandhi, uh, Tutsu, Tutsu uh, Mandela, uh, all the Dalai Lama. So these are, of course, the big tickets ones. But all, all the rest. So this is their, uh, what they want to do is from all over the world, select instances, put them into modern technological form so that they become good stories, and spread them all over the world through all kind of media. And they have, I think, enough money for that. Now, how, how well it will play, and we will, we will see. You know, Nantara, we were talking about uh, love and this, the, the, there's a strong gene of martyrdom in love. You know, whether you die for love, whether you're willing to give up everything for love. Uh, and then there is that facet of universal love, which, is, you know, which uh, Gandhi and others have used as political tools. There's another, the destructive facet of love, same desire for martyrdom, religious love, you know, which if we were to understand what, what happens to a human being, what is that force that takes control of us that can completely change us as people? You know, uh, when we think of love, um, is it the same emotion really which pushes one to destruction as well as to being constructive and creative? No, I don't, I don't think so. Um, I think love is a, a very creative force. And I think ultimately it is not uh, something longing for martyrdom or to die for. I'm sorry to disagree about this, but I think it is so essentially something to live for that it is driven by the urge for self-satisfaction in the same way that we write. Why do we write? We don't write to get published or even to be read. It's wonderful to be read, but we write because there's an overpowering urge to write, to satisfy something in ourselves. And I think love is related to that urge, whether it is the love for God, which is longing and working for self-realization. In Hinduism, that's what we call salvation, self-realization. And uh, so I think this, it's essentially a, a strong urge for life, not for death, to live to satisfy oneself in so many different ways. And this huge urge for self-satisfaction is what drives uh, a lover and it's what drives a creative writer. In fact, you've just uh, sort of cued me for my next question, Tarun, which is about creativity and love. Why is it that across time and across history, uh, creative people have been the greatest rule breakers where love is concerned? What is this peculiar relationship between love and creativity? whether it's in film, art, writers. It's probably some kind of a deep dysfunction, you know, I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and, and it's always an anxiety to overcome this dysfunction, you know, I mean, the, the, the need for both things, uh, the need to create, and I'm sure, you know, we've been hearing these wonderful science, men of science over the last three days, and I'm sure there's some like, a, a, a proper explanation for it about endorphins and so on, yeah. But what is true is that when you are in that exalted state of love, I mean, whether it's the endorphins or whatever you want to call it, or, or you want to call it as something poetic, it it's clearly sets you apart. It's, as you said, the reason to live. And I think that's what you pursue, that, that reason to live. Now, the truth of the matter is that, the, alas, alas, the truth of the matter is that not everybody ends up knowing love, you know? And, and for a variety of reasons, and that it can go from religion to society to anything, a great deal of the world is actually shut off from experiencing the true exaltations of love. And it appears, it comes to you in fragments, in small ways. This is my own experience as I speak, and I'm sure Sudhir will have much more to say about it. And I love the guy who's putting a billion behind, freeing up everybody to love. I think, great guy, you know? <laughs> but, but it is, uh, you know, it, 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 it's actually not available to most people, because anybody who has known the exaltation of love in a real sense cannot then have a doubt that this is not something to live for, that, that, you know, that, that other things should take precedence over this. I, I, that, 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 that's what I believe. And even in, in the alchemy of desire, which was my own exploration of, of, the, of, of love and desire, I mean, the attempt was to actually try and explore the many faces of love. And just as people are, 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 are various, 
the faces of love are various, you know, and it's not very easy to arrive at one universal for that. But Everyone finds and expresses it. Sudhir has something to say on that. No, I mean, reacting to your uh, thing, I don't think the faces of love are that uh, various. Uh, you see that the problems of love, let's put them, or contradiction, or where, what makes you somehow also uneasy with it, that there are two currents which run through love. So one is desire, and desire which is like excitement, the exaltation of possession, uh, overcoming, that is one current which goes. And the other current, which is very contradictory, which is the longing, tenderness of longing. So desire wants to overcome, and tenderness wants to be porous, to open us. And they are contradictory because desire wants to be the master and tenderness wants to be the slave. So love has these two currents going on. You want to be both the master and the slave. And unless they are in balance, sometimes one goes off, you were saying, of the destruction. That is where the longing has so much there. I'm completely porous. That's where the dangers of love come in. Desire has its dangers, you know, the, and when you're, you may be rejected. You may, you have may be desiring too much, so the shame, oh my God, how much, how much I've desired. And then there will be mortification. I mean, for men, uh, to put it, uh, I think, uh, let me put it more mildly, say, Nabokovian phrase, uh, there's mortification when your desire too early dissolves in a puddle of pleasure. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so uh, and whereas, <laughs> well, I mean, all these are dangers and fears and dreads of. There's so much mortification that wasn't even allowed. <laughs> these are all then the dreads of love. And longing, of course, uh, at the tenderness when you are porous, the terror at your helplessness. You've lost complete control. You are in control of this other person. So love is a very dangerous one. That's why the exaltations are so few. Because people do not navigate those two, do not come through those, and they remain stuck in the dreads and fears, and because if it is prom promising so much exaltation, then it must have so many hurdles also to cross. I mean, that's a, it's a mystical way. But, 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 once, once, but uh, just to add to that, part of the great attraction and fascination for love is also the fact of its mysterious nature. Yeah. And, and I'm saying, without the mystery, you know, you, you would probably, it'll pay on you. you. I mean, you, you can make money by making balance sheets and spreadsheets and building buildings, but you can't crack the, the business of love all your life, so it's something you also struggle oh, against God. to understand it, and you start afresh every morning. You have to figure it out. But Tarun, I was going to ask you that, uh, and I'm going to yeah, come no, back. I was just going to say that I, I think I think at different age and in your life, you have a different understanding. Like you were saying, you you shouldn't die for love; you should live for it. I think, like he was saying, there are two different, you know. This uh, this, this this by the way is a different. I think it's just about age. You, me, and Nayantara. <laughs> A different age, us versus she versus us. I really think like there's a point in your life when you feel like, okay, I want to die for this man. And then you want to, you come to a point and stage in your life where you understand another facet of love, like you were saying, where you want to live for it. So I think, I don't think there's anything wrong at a point in your life where you want to die for it, because that's what all you understand of love at that point. So I think the face of love does change. Um, probably with how much you love yourself as well. <laughs> sometimes you want to die, but sometimes you want to live. So, no, I think yeah. dying, dying for love is a very romantic idea, yes. uh, which doesn't at all have anything to do with the truth about love. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't <laughs> want to die. I'm sure we're like 50-50 here on this one. Yeah. We, we still okay. have a bit of time. I just wanted to put two quick questions. Uh, one is to Sudhir and to you, Tarun, that is the multiplicity of love, you know, this multiple face of love, is it really something that is overrated and that is really uh, something that artists have exalted over time? Because when it comes down to it, probably love is a very constant emotion. You know, for instance, Picasso's women. Picasso was the great lover, but actually he ended up injuring a lot of women. And in, at the end of his life, he finds a woman he actually loves and wants to possess, and she walks out on him. So is it really, even Krishna and Radha, the great lover, Radha is always injured, you know. She's always seeking that one constancy which she doesn't get. So both in art and in, uh, in, in myth, is this multifaceted face of love a construct that doesn't really exist? Sudhir, answer it. If you start it like <laughs> well, well, Picasso is the face of desire. Radha is the face of longing. So these are the two, both you can see it. 
Just one to completely. <laughs> two faces are lying. I my interpreter well. <laughs> and the two are never in balance. <laughs> no, the, the, no the, actually, the, yeah, I think this is the last, to, uh, perhaps a hint to people. Uh, they are, they can both be, when they are in balance is when there's a complete stillness. There's no desire and there is no love. And that stillness comes when the lovers are very, very close together and over a long period of time because that empathy is not so easily attained. You've, it goes through stages. You have to first be tolerance, which you learn in love. Tolerance means giving the other person benefit of doubt, then compassion, then empathy. So the unity is very, very far away. So there are those moments where desire and longing are still. And one moment is, uh, poets talk about it, uh, Bhavbhuti, when he describes Ram and Sita lying on, and th that stillness is often, okay, uh, after, if, if it is a loving one, I'm not talking of sex, I'm talking of loving sexual, sexual love, which is very different. At the end of orgasm, when both are just lying together, when the bodies have separated, but the souls are still entwined. That is a small moment where desire and longing are still. So one, please do not immediately turn and smoke a cigarette. Stay, <laughs> stay in that uh, if you are for some moments, uh, for a moment, because that is, that is the only time when the spiritual will touch you or can touch you for most of us. Uh, which we often don't see. It's, it's like dreams. People say, I don't remember dreams. It is because you open your eyes immediately when you wake up. If you kept your eyes closed, for, then you will remember some of the last dream. So this is one of the hints uh, which I would I give for it. I will, I will sign on the paper, wherever he's putting it. Sudhi, <laughs> can you start a coaching center? <laughs> Chitrang, <laughs> Chitrang, I, want, I probably need to end with you, but I wanted to pay homage to one face of love that we haven't discussed which are the two characters in your films, the constant, the boring, constant love. You know, the, the love that is not s sparkling, the love that doesn't put you in a state of exaltation, but the love that has companionship and constancy and empathy, you know. Um, it, when, when, when you're looking and you're acting and you're presenting and you're looking for love in your own life, would there be any space ever for that kind of boring, constant companionship? I, I think we're talking about the moment just after, where, <laughs> where you just lie next to each other. Well, I don't know if it'll be boring at that point when you've actually reached a point where you could be lying next to each other and the souls are still kind of connected. I don't know how, it might be stayed, there might not be that much of desire which is kind of burning inside you and making you restless, but it may not be boring because you would have gone through that stage of desire, of wanting this person and burning with it and whatever and wanting to die. I think having arrived at a stage where you can just lie next to each other and, and feel connected um, may not be boring at that point. I think it'll be nice to just arrive at it and I think that would be beautiful at that point. So I, I don't know if, and I definitely would want to be, be there, just, you know, lying connected or whatever that is, yeah. I don't need coaching. <laughs> Yeah, okay, great. I have, I have an uh, alternative career, so I can do that. Um, unfortunately, these three days have come to an end. Um, we've sort of left every session with some thought bubbles in our head. For me, something that Nayantara said, I think, really summed it up, which was that love is the greatest expression of individualism. It is what makes us human. It is what helps us fight society, history, the passage of time, and love is finally individualism. If we can be ourselves, that is the biggest achievement and triumph of all. Thank you so much for being here.